Welcome in to episode 323 of the Source to Say podcast, your go to Kentucky basketball and recruiting podcast on the Growing KSR Podcast Network. I am your host, Jack Pilgrim of Kentucky. Yo, very excited to be joined once again by the one and only Sean Smith of Go Big Blue Country. Sean, how the heck are you? I'm fantastic, Jack. Uh, it's been a bit since uh, we've we've been on here to talk. I wasn't on last week, obviously, and then Nashville happened. So uh, we'll get into all that. Yeah, it's been a heck of a ride. We didn't get to celebrate an unbelievable statement for my money, best win of the season uh, victory down in Knoxville where we saw this team really put together some elite freaking basketball where you left Knoxville. Obviously, the last 55 seconds were what they were. We don't have to talk about that. Uh, but that was a game that you started to see the vision where you like we had seen the vision uh, Auburn. Uh, I mean, North Carolina earlier in the year, we've seen them play championship level basketball, but it felt like that was truly the the moment that we were like, OK, you Kentucky is now the hottest team in the SEC going into the postseason right on schedule. That's when Cal's teams have been at their best. You know, the best teams have been at their best going into March. So it just felt like everything was building toward SEC tournament and on. Uh there was a level of excitement in Nashville. Obviously, you were down there with me. That it's we've seen peaks like that, but consistently for 40 minutes. I don't remember the last time we've seen that level of intensity in Bridgestone Arena where you were just like, Man, this is why BBN is the absolute best. This is why we do this. Like it, it would, you know, you just kind of sit there on press row and just like soaking that moment in. And you're like, damn, this is awesome. This is what all of this is about. And then Kentucky loses the game. And how they lost, I think, is mostly irrelevant at this point, considering we're, you know, kind of past that. We saw what it did for the seating. We saw um what the draw looked like for Kentucky. And it ended up not mattering at all. Like it. It was frustrating in the heat of the moment to watch Kentucky take some, um, in my opinion, you know, regress a little bit on the defensive end, kind of revert back to some bad habits that we kind of thought that they broke at their peak at Auburn, at Tennessee. We saw them put together elite stretches. Cal said leaving the Tennessee game that Monday, they watched film of 10 championship level offensive possessions and 10 championship level defensive possessions and said, if you could just give us this, we're going to Phoenix. Like this is this is all it is, and we we just didn't get any of that against a team that basically just rolled out its same game plan as we saw in College Station beat us the exact same way. So there was a a level of frustration with that where it's like, damn, we were building up for this March run, and now that March is here. It's just kind of not that it just kind of the rug was ripped out from under us. And I, I just felt the fans in that moment of how much they poured into it, the resources, the time, the money. And it was just like, damn, now this run in March is just that much more important because this team is just way too good. We, they're so enjoyable. We, it, there's so much about this group that you want to, that, that you love and, and, want to keep watching them play and you just don't want this to exp experience to end. So all of those feelings kind of hit you at the same time, Sean, you were there. How did you feel in the aftermath of all of it? Well, it, I, I told you it, it felt like deja vu, honestly, because uh, my last two trips in Nashville, I have been there covered two Kentucky basketball games. And I think I've been in the city, maybe a combined 10 hours because it's cover it. What, you know, watch it, cover it, leave, watch it, cover it, leave. And I go home and I get home. I, I don't want to make the annual get home at three 30 in the morning trip anymore, but I was so frustrated that I drove home for the second straight year in a row because I was like, I can't go to sleep. So I'm just going to make this my drive home to kind of just let it all out to myself and frustrated. Honestly, and the the reason it is, and obviously it, it doesn't impact seating. We see that, like these teams went into this tournament what they were, and they came out of it what they are. Here's where I have concerns, though, and they can change it this week and next. There is, when you look at it, 
there's some common denominators between success in this program. And when they've had success in that tournament, they have had success in the next one. Whether they won it or they lost in the championship game, those years that they've done that, they've been a good NCAA tournament team. Other than, obviously, 2016, where they lost in the second round after winning it with Tyler Ulysses and Jamal Murray. There are some a few outliers there. But the last four years, they've not had success there, and then they've also not had success in the one that mattered. So am I looking too much into it? Maybe if it's a year or two, does it concern me a little bit? Yes, because you want to be playing your best basketball, and I still feel like this is a team that's still trying to establish some rhythm and, and get some guys going and only playing once and then here having a week-long layoff again without playing. Like it, I'm concerned about it, but I like the draw that they got. I do think this is one of the better draws that they've had under John Calipari. I don't think you can have any kind of – because there's people out there, Jack, that probably say, how's Kentucky a three? But – the overall wins loss record looks the same, but the wins they have this year are significantly better than the wins they had a year ago. When you beat the top two, you beat a one seed, you beat another number four, another or two, a couple number fours. Like you've got some wins that put you in this position to get there. Even had they won two games, I don't even think they would have moved to a two. I think they still would have been a three. But I'm just more disappointed that the fans didn't get a run in Nashville. And you've not, you and I together have not experienced a run at the SEC tournament. Yeah, so as soon as Cal ended the Tennessee game, he goes to the podium and somebody asks, you know, did the importance of a double buy in Nashville, did, was that, you know, something that you guys prioritized going into this game? And he said, uh, no, the you guys know the tournament that I care about. And immediately, like, my sirens went off in my head of, well, fans aren't going to like hearing that. Because they know how much, you know, we know how much the fans, this is the, the SEC tournament is the fans event. It is. I mean, it's it's been the Kentucky Invitational forever. That's, I mean, the, that has been this program's event for, I mean, as long as any fan that I know can, can remember. So as soon as that happened, I knew that it was going to be a controversy. And then on Monday, the call-in show he talked about the why, and he said, I've been doing this long enough. I know that it really doesn't make a difference if you win on Sunday or not. It does not impact your seating whatsoever. We remember the Texas A&M game, the, how that seating worked out with the Tyler Uless team and all that. So there is a sample size there, but I don't know. After the loss, I, I just kind of had this mindset of you. this team desperately needed three more quad one wins to be – in the conversation for a two seed, but firmly solidify a three. So I thought that not only are you adding a loss, that didn't matter. It was a quad one loss, but not getting the three extra quad ones because the the way we had talked leading up to it, the, you know, shaking out with the net, kind of how that adjusted up and down and, and how we had lost like the Mississippi State game at home and some of the different ones that were kind of on that line. We didn't have the resume on paper that it felt like we did leaving the event, leaving the regular season. So I was like, damn, unbelievable missed opportunity to build a number two seed, maybe firmly solidify a three seed uh, in, you know, on selection Sunday, that was part of the frustration. That was part of the damn man, another missed opportunity for us to help our, help our run. We are all in on, on Phoenix what if this is going to be the difference of us getting the four in UConn's region, having to play them in the sweet 16 versus an elite eight matchup. Like we, all of those kind of things played into that emotion and the frustration. And then you get to selection Sunday, the seeds start coming out. And then Auburn who does go to Sunday wins the whole thing playing as hot as anybody in that event. Bruce Pearl's crying on TV about how important this moment means for him. He gets that four seed in UConn's region, and you go, well, damn, that sucks. Well, where's Kentucky going to be? And then the show keeps going, and 10 minutes later, we get the three in a favorable draw, not having to play a defensive juggernaut until what would be the Elite Eight for a, a you know potential opportunity to the Final Four the matchups are unbelievably favorable. So it, it, it kind of became a, damn, all those feelings and emotions that I had leaving Nashville were completely wasted. Like Cal was completely right about why he doesn't put everything into that event, why he doesn't 
put pressure on the kids to go out and win it because he knows that it doesn't do that. So that was me as a an emotional fan after the fact going, damn, I this was a wasted opportunity. And then knowing, okay, well, Auburn made it two days past where Kentucky did, two fewer days of rest and got screwed on their seating. So now it's like, you know what? At this point, I love Nashville. I could have, I would have loved another night to go out and celebrate and have fun with UK fans and talk and, and, you know, be amongst my people because I love that event personally. But now looking at how everything unfolded after the fact, I really do not feel any type of way about the SEC tournament. I, I just, I, at this point, it, the, the proof is in the pudding and the, the layout is, has worked unbelievably in Kentucky's favor. So, it's been a, a an unbelievable like two day stretch of emotions, Sean. Like I, I I don't remember feeling the highs and lows in this tiny window in a very long time. No, and it, it made it weird like over the whole weekend because once it got to Sunday morning, you know, my mind shifted to let's see what the bracket looks like, let's see what the path is like for Kentucky. But I mean, I, I still. I still put value in the SEC tournament just from a, a coaching perspective of wanting your team to play well. And then for this fan base, a, a fan base that takes pride in every single time that they step on the floor, I mean, this fan base, Jack, they don't like losses in November. They don't like them in December, and they sure as hell don't like them in March, regardless of of when they come. But overall, you to me, you you get a favorable draw. You're in Pittsburgh. You're close. A lot of Kentucky fans are going to make that trip. It's uh, you, you on paper, you are, I want to say confident that you are going to get out of the first weekend, but you better bring it and show up both games. But at least when I look at it this year, I have a little bit more hope than the matchups than what I've had the past few years. Now, does Kentucky bring it on the defensive end of the floor just enough? Because that's the takeaway from Friday night. This offense is great. This offense is going to put up points. Got off to a bad start. We've been talking about that. They never recovered. Jack, at any point in that game, did I ever feel like Kentucky was going to get over the hump and win it? That's a painful feeling to sit there and know that you got guys that can make shots, but you can't do enough on the other end. But here, it's a couple of things with Kentucky still. Not an elite defensive rebounding team. Nowhere near an average defensive team. Like those two areas together will kill you in this tournament and will send you home. And then you also can't do the one thing that you've not done all year and you decide to do it. Live ball turnovers that give other teams baskets. You compounded it with that. So when you throw all that in the mix, it's easy to see why Kentucky left with one and done in the the SEC tournament. Is when you put all that in there, they were still right there, got it down to what, three at one point in the second half? Hangs around seven to eight, it felt like for a majority of the game just couldn't string the stops together that you needed. They just have to get a few stops, just a few stops. This is also a team that I don't see, Jack, that's built to come from behind because they can't get stops to start runs. That crowd was amazing, but they never got to make an impact because Kentucky couldn't get stops to string it along. So the thing for me in this tournament is you've got to get out to early starts because this team is not built to play from behind. We saw, yeah, we saw them come back against Arkansas at Rupp Arena. Arkansas is not a good basketball team. Against good teams in this tournament, you cannot fall behind because I just don't feel like this this team can get stops and get itself in position to win games. It needs to be playing with a lead or somewhere near, you know, a tie. Like that's that's the game by game stuff that I feel like this team needs to advance. So Cal addressed some of that tonight in his his call and radio show. A lot of it was finger pointing at you know, people that are trying to get this this thing derailed and not let them get to the finish line. I disagree with a lot of, uh, of that stuff, but that's for a different time and a different day. But um, he talked about not wanting to change the starting lineup because he doesn't think that that is the reason why they are getting out to slow starts, that it's, you know – defensive approach, different, just different factors leading into it, not the personnel, uh, but behind it, but he changed his tune kind of tonight, knowing that Oakland is a deep, is a zone oriented defense that does a lot of stuff that 
Cowell wants to combat with potentially a different starting lineup to, you know, throw, throw something different out there. So that was the first time that we've heard him kind of change his tune ever so slightly where he said in a vacuum, the starting lineup does not matter. Reed and Rob have not even come to him and said, Hey man, what do you think about us? You, you know, getting off to a hot start, put us in instead, and let's see what that works. Like that has not been a conversation once. He said, I think that's a little overrated. But with a zone heavy team in Oakland, it's something he may be considering. What would that look like to you, Sean? What would be the best lineup to combat that? And potentially get Kentucky out to a better start than we saw in Nashville. I don't think the lineup's changing. Just being honest. Do you? It it was weird. It was a very, like, he explained the importance of kind of keeping what's working and just kind of the, the building the continuity and not changing something at the last second just for the sake of doing so. But then – specifically said the only reason why I would do something like that was to would be to combat a, to combat his yeah, and, and, and start knowing that we're going up against his own heavy team. The the thing with Cal here, I feel like Cal gets so defensive about a lot of things and he will defend it and, and he'll find ways to defend it. Even though he knows in the back of his mind, I think he knows he needs to change it, but then start talking about, well, I'll do that if it's, a, if, if we're playing against the zone, well, I don't see him doing it regardless because I think that he's ingrained in who he is, especially at this point, what, 32 games in? And if that's what he believes in and that's what he wants to roll with, then you just got to get off to a good start. And that means you can't turn it over. You need Antonio Reeves probably to knock down a shot early. You need DJ Wagner to get a bucket. You need you need something to kind of go in your favor there early because, like, what happened Friday night getting down 8-1 to one and then taking a timeout, and in that timeout you changed nothing about the lineup and just roll it right back out there, that can't happen this week. Because I'm telling you, if it happens, they're going home. And I've that's that's the stuff that's going to frustrate the heck out of me is you've got to have the right guys on the floor, Jack, this time of year. And what and we've seen we've, we're talking tweaks and defensive tweaks. What defensive tweak is going to make this team just snap its finger and defend better? We've watched it 32 games. Adding two seven-footers isn't going to do it because when that happens, guess what happens to your offense? You get worse. So now you're not scoring at the clip that you're wanting to score at. And maybe you grab an extra rebound or two, or maybe you affect a shot here, but what are you doing with it on the other end of the floor? My thing is keep going with it offensively and then strategically try to be a better defensive team. And it starts with this. This team is terrible at this. They don't talk. Me and you sitting courtside the other night, I didn't see any communication. I saw overhelping. I saw not being able to guard simple middle ball screen, straight line drives off middle ball screen. And then when Z and these seven footers do go to block a shot, there's nobody stepping over, rotating, and, and cleaning up a box or a box out. There's just no communication and attention to detail there. But as far as lineups go, Reed's got to be on the floor as much as possible. Rob Dillingham's got to be on the floor as much as possible. As far as seven footers and which one you go with, I just don't see this being the tournament where you can play all three. You can't. I will, like, I, I will say, listening to Cal tonight, he mentioned all of them by name, specifically saying that Aaron Bradshaw was going to be somebody that is going to make an impact in this tournament. Um and would be somebody that we go, damn, why isn't Aaron Bradshaw playing a little bit more? And I will say, there was that stretch before the Tennessee game where Aaron was playing pretty solid. I thought he put together some stretches against Vanderbilt in the, in the on senior night that I, were some of the best two-way stretches we've seen him play all season long. And then he plays two minutes in Knoxville. There, you know, That's up for debate whether or not he needed more. but. If it was working, I, I understand why you're just like, let's just ride what's working and not, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But Cal singled him out and said that he's going to be somebody that we say down the road, wow, I can't believe that he didn't play more because he's going to be making an impact in this tournament. 
then mentioned Z in a similar fashion, said that, you know, same thing with Z. He's just immature. Sometimes you think that he's a 12 year old, all that. But um, it didn't sound like somebody that was going to go small anytime soon. No. And they're, they're just, I I don't know. That's like what, what's Bradshaw's minutes been the last few games. Very hot and cold, unbelievably hot and cold. He played against Texas A&M uh, three minutes, three whole minutes. And and maybe this is just a confidence thing to where you're hoping that you're you're doing it here. You're speaking here, and you, you're hoping that he's staying in a good frame of mind. That way, if he does get an opportunity, maybe he makes a couple of high-energy plays. Marcus Lee against Michigan in 2014 kind of breaks through, and not just kind of breaks through, but broke through and made an impact and helped them win the game. If that's what he's hoping for, then, I mean, that's asking a lot for somebody to come in and, and do those things and make plays at this moment in the season when you've not really had the confidence enough to put them out there in the most recent stretch of play. Like, I think and, – and, and Brad, I went back and listened to Dane Bradshaw. I went back and watched the game on Saturday night, like I always do. Whether I cover it or whether I'm sitting at the house, I will go back and rewatch before we get on here and talk. And, and Dane was talking about how there's been a lot of changing with these lineups this year, especially on the interior. I don't know if you went back and watched it or not, but Dane was mm-hmm. talking about how there's just been a lot of different lineups and things that does John Calipari know who his best five is. North Carolina knows who their best five is right now. UConn certainly knows who their best five is. I hope Cal knows. I think we all know. But I hope that he figures it out, and I hope that they're out there the majority of the game and given a chance to run because I think Dane hit the nail on the head. There's been so much interchanging of bigs, and the bigs has been what's done it and kept it off balance to me. It's not as much about the starting lineup because when you look at minutes played, Reed is up there at the top. Rob gets his moments, especially when he's when he's on a, a hot clip and things like that. But Jack, like, the interchanging of the bigs has probably been the biggest storyline since we left the North Carolina game because it's been one for two games and it's another one for two games. And then Bradshaw comes through like the inconsistency there is probably held this team back to an extent when it comes to finding a cohesiveness with a group of five or six or seven guys, because I still see a lot of shuffling and, and, and mixing up when I just don't really know where Cal wants to go at the four or five. And then if you're going to get Antonio Reeves in foul trouble, that's why it's important to start your game with the best lineup because we never got to really see Rob Reed and Antonio on the floor together. Who are your three best shooters, three best perimeter scorers? If there's going to be foul trouble, then you need to get them on there as much as possible. But I don't know how often Antonio Reeves is going to get in foul trouble in the NCAA tournament. I mean, it's not happened a ton, ton with him. But does that make any sense what I'm talking about with the lineups, though? Like, it just – we're 32 games in and I'm still confused on what we're wanting to do at the five. Which uh, on that note, I, I do want to, again, officiating did not cause ten, Kentucky's loss in Nashville, but that was probably the most frustrated I've been in an individual game from start to finish of how the game was called the timeliness of things. The one side, like it, having things be let go on one end and then calling a ticky tack foul on the other. I I just can't remember the last time I've been that. And I think that was part of the reason why I was so emotionally just pissed with everything I had in me after that game ended, because it felt like there was just never a gap for us to get back in it because you had Wade Taylor just, doing Wade Taylor things. He played out of his mind. He was, he was awesome. Uh, I mean, Tyrese Radford hitting big shots and the way he scored. And then it would be an and one. It wouldn't just be a a two would be an and one. It was, it was just every little thing where Kentucky would just like crack that door open. It was either big shot by Wade Taylor, Tyrese Radford, or a stupid inexcusable call that just went slam every, every time, just slam that door shut. And it just, it, like I had a moment where I was like, this is just not Kentucky's night, man. And I remember feeling that against Kansas State last year in in the round of 32, saying, it's just not our night. This is 
this is their night. This is their moment. It's not ours. And it just, it creates a feeling in me going into Pittsburgh, going into this run, having that, that, well, what if it's not our night? What happens then? We, this team's just too enjoyable. We can't not experience Phoenix. I remember so vividly sitting there with you in Chicago, the United Center, after that game saying this road ends in Phoenix. They're just too much, too much talent, too fun. But it, it, it's like once we're officially in March mode, it's like those nerves. Like I immediately clam up. It's like just do or die, man. It's it's a very weird feeling. It is. It is very weird. And 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 this this is where I'm going to take the next the next line here. And I, I told you this before we went live. There's a lot of talk about pressure. Pressure on the kids. Pressure on the program. I don't know what the kids feel, but watching Friday night, and he can deny it all he wants, the weight of the world's on John Calipari's shoulders because he coached very tense, and he was tight. While a few steps down the sideline, Buzz Williams was as loose as he's ever been, and his kids played that way, where Kentucky played tight. And I'm saying this from a coach, and I made I made a mistake like this one time coaching where I was just over tense and just tight in a, in a game, and it was it was a big big game, honestly. But we lost, and my kids felt it, and my kids talked to me about it. They're like, "You didn't seem like yourself." I'm watching Cal literally do this and not just screaming at Z and screaming at Ugo begging them to come set middle ball screens. And it was like seven or eight straight possessions where he's just losing his mind on the sidelines and then losing his mind on the officials, which was was bad. I will give him that. But however upset you are and whatever 30, 20 seconds you're wasting in a timeout, it's not going to change what just happened on the floor. Just coach your team. It's hard. I get it. But I see someone who's putting the weight of this on his shoulders, and I just don't want to bleed over to these guys and his team. Like he's got to absorb it and channel it because early in the year, I made the comment to you on this show that he was loose and the guys were playing loose in that game against Kansas that they lost. I didn't see Cal screaming. I didn't see him stomping. I didn't see him yelling. I saw him coaching and encouraging, picking guys up as the season grew and went along, Jack. And we got into January. I started seeing this and it got tighter and tighter and tighter. He cannot coach tight in this tournament. If he does, that's when I feel like he loses track of some things. If he's loose, the guys are loose. Go back and watch the best games this year he's coached and been relaxed. But the ones where they've struggled, it's he gets very tense and he gets more animated, and that's the ones where guys really start to feel the pressure. That's how guys feel pressure. And that's why tonight and the presser after the bracket reveal was, I don't want to say concerning, but like it was 90 to 95%. You guys are adding pressure. You guys are adding pressure. The, there are people that want this thing to fail if, you know, they, they want the weight on these players' shoulders. So, you know, because they want to double down on their agendas because once they, you know, if if they were to mess up early, then they can double down on their hot takes about, you know, what. And it's like, why are we even entertaining this stuff? And I liked, you know, they Cal took the team bowling on Sunday, which is awesome. I think that is an awesome, you know, talked about how Trey was the leading scorer. And, you know, he they asked how since when have you been good at bowling and he said you know i'm 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 just humble i never wanted to to show off and they it, you know it was fun friendly banter that's the mindset that this stuff needs to be loose 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 nothing and, and cal talked a lot about that how his job right now is to be a cheerleader to you know he just wants nothing on their shoulders nothing but loose going into pittsburgh but when you talk about it for 50 minutes it kind of feels like you're projecting. It feels like you're making yourself talk about how loose you are if, rather than just being loose. So I agree. That's something that I have my eye on. And I'm like, dude, just you have a, 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 a 
one thing that I loved. He talked about he the the team went in a circle and said, you know, what would be the reasons why you guys couldn't make a run? Mm, defense, you know, engagement has been incon- inconsistent at times. Like it was like two or three things, and then Cal said, okay. Now let's go in a, a circle and talk about why this team's capable of going to Phoenix. And it was, well, we have Antonio Reeves and nobody else does. It was, we have Reed Shepard and nobody else does. Nobody can score the way do. And it like the list just kept growing and and it kind of created this moment that Cal talked about. That's what the mindset should be about. Stop worrying about pressure and and the the, all, the tightness, all that stuff. Don't project. Don't deflect. Just absorb it. As you said, be loose. This team is damn good. That is absolutely capable of making it to Phoenix. Let them. Let, let, this, let this stuff take itself off. They're capable no. of, of making that happen. Yeah, the, the word pressure shouldn't even be mentioned to this team at all. Don't even say it. Just, just play. You've got the best backcourt in college basketball, in my opinion. You've got the one area where every coach entering this tournament wishes they had elite scores in the backcourt, multiple elite scores in the backcourt. Just go let them be themselves, be the version of you that you were in November and December and at times in January. And this thing's going to work out the way you want it to because they've got a really good team, Jack. Mm-hmm. They've got guys that can go. Amazing. There's a reason that everybody out here is picking them to go to Phoenix. It's not just the draw because, I mean, Jeff Goodman said, tell me somebody in that bracket that's going to beat them. Well, I can tell you one that beat them twice, Texas A&M. But everybody's buying Kentucky because of the offense. Rob Dillingham, Reed Shepard, Antonio Reeves making shots. Like People know what Kentucky can be. North Carolina knows. Auburn knows. Tennessee knows. Alabama knows. We, though, are – putting four to five years on top of it. And that's where I think the the tense feelings and the pressure that maybe me and you and the people that are in this chat right now, majority of them probably feels because it's been a while. You can't – I don't want to throw four to five years on top of these guys when they didn't impact the previous four or five years. Cal can't. Cal just has to be relaxed, Jack. And I think if Cal's relaxed, I think these guys play relaxed. And I think we're sitting here a week from now talking about who they're playing in the Sweet 16. And then when you get to that, I think some pressure starts to go away a little bit because you're back where you belong. You back where you're back in the weekend that you're that you've been in a lot. And then I think as Cal gets to that point in the tournament, I think Cal starts to find himself a little bit. And then it's about getting back to the Final Four. And this team can do it. It's just. Do they do the fatal things that have killed them all season? Not rebounding and not defending. And then you can't get off the bad starts. You've got to make shots early. If they're not, you have got to be attentive and and communicate on the defensive end of the floor. Just be capable defensively. And if they're capable defensively, they got dudes that can make shots. My favorite comment out of everything that we heard – Tonight, radio show, post game or um, post reveal uh, press conference with the players or whatever. Uh, Rob Dillingham was asked about his favorite March moment growing up, what he watched as a kid. He was like, Man, I loved Kemba Walker in his run. I thought that run with UConn was just one that I, you know, that's what March is about. And he was like, And honestly, what Kemba did is kind of something that gives us confidence going into March because of the guards, you know, all the stuff that we think in our heads, Rob Dillingham is like Kemba Walker mindset dude that can just kind of get going. And when he ramps up, it's like, Oh boy, he can go win you a damn game. So for that guy of all people to say that was his favorite March moment, even though it kind of came at the expense of Kentucky, unfortunately, uh, like, that was a baller comment because that's 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 what I think in my head of why we have kind of look. It's been tough throughout the year. The three game losing streak at home, first time in the rubber in history. UNC Wilmington. It's been tough taking some of that stuff on the chin. I'll be totally transparent. 
I it sucks losing those games and it sucked you know defending a lot of it and saying guys this is about down the road let's let's get there let's ignore this stuff let's let's enjoy this ride and get there while just kind of you know hearing you guys are cal kiss assers and blah, blah blah and i'm like dude but no look at the team that we have look how exciting they are look what they are capable of doing but like that's what this is all for like we're we're here at this moment this is the built for march stuff this is the like i overvalued what wins in nashville meant because we saw on selection sunday it meant nothing that's the pass we absolutely correct in that in that assessment in that judgment now we're at the fun stuff now we are at the real stuff as cal said after the the texas a m loss like now it's time it, it's let's have rob have his kimba walker moment let's be on the good side of that this time and how about tennessee getting their ass kicked by st peter's let's like reverse all of the past junk that we've experienced through this program let's have rob re be kemba reincarnated and let's have the the peacocks erase that that two years ago the, is, uh, the oscar game let's let's erase all of the bad juju is that a name your score game jack i i can't dude i can't i can't wait to hear about their shoot around i i i'm so excited to hear about saint peter's shoot around and be able to just laugh you know you know, that was the worst shoot around I've ever seen in my entire life. I just thought they were lethargic, looked like they were coming out for a funeral, Sean. <laughs> I think Tennessee can name name its score this week. I truly do. I, there's no reason a two seed should ever be concerned about a 15 seed, especially the Peacocks. I, I just think it'd be egregious of them to even think that anything other than the inevitable is going to happen. We're all St. Peter's fan. They're St. St. Peter's fans this I'm week. I'm rooting for it. I'm rooting for it just as hard as any other game I've ever rooted for in my life. I brought up Indianapolis to you the other day about the possibility of like, could we end up there? And you're like, please no, please no. no. Oh God, no! I would I wouldn't have gone. I I'm so done with that godforsaken city. I have seen the worst of the worst there. I I remember vividly the COVID year champions classic going there and going this is the worst venue in my life this is the worst event i've ever been a part of and then the next time we get a a a run we get a national player of the year there's so much excitement building up to it we go right back to that hell hole and suffer history in the worst um, worst way imaginable and i i i decided at that point i even left like two hundred dollars worth of shoes and shirts and clothes in my hotel room because i was so pissed off the next day i just like grab my stuff and left and I left bags of clothes. I've never been more mad and sad and depressed leaving an event. And I, I, I told myself I'm never coming back ever again for no excuse, no event, no sporting event, nothing. If they were sent there, I would have sent an intern to take my spot. I was, I was not going to Indianapolis. <laughs> well, we're not going to Indy. We're going to Pittsburgh. What do you Are know you about Pittsburgh? What do you, what, what, what's the, I've never been. Do you, have you, have I've, you ever been? I've never been. So uh, sources say takes over Pittsburgh for the first time because I've never been to Pittsburgh. Looking forward to going to Pittsburgh, though. I'm, I'm, I want to see. I, I saw a lot of people posting that they bought tickets and that they've they've got tickets and they're going. Good. So that's 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 encouraging because like I, I feel like that. Obviously, this team needs the fans and it needs that environment and it needs it to be good. And and you get to that second game. Now, obviously, we're not going to get it too far ahead of ourselves. We got to beat Oakland first, but you get to that game on Saturday, that fan base can make a difference in helping push you over the edge and get you to that second weekend. And Jack, I think that's the biggest hurdle. Last year we talked just win a game in this thing because they hadn't won a tournament game in forever. Now the emphasis has kind of shifted to the second game. Get over the second game, but you can't overlook Oakland. Get by Oakland, get by that second round matchup. Just give us a week to process and be back in that second weekend, and let's see what happens with this team from there. But uh, like, like I said, this this team's got a chance. It's got dudes that can score. I'm still going to take scoring over defense. I just wish the defense wasn't as bad as what it is. <laughs> like if it could, if you could just give me half of it, cut it in half, then I, I'm rocking with a lot more confidence than what I am right now. But just figured out 
they have guys, you know, Cal said built for March. This program has been built for March for a long time because that's the way it's been created since Cal's been here. Nothing matters till March. It worked out the first six or seven years. It's not worked out the last five or six. Can he rekindle some magic? That's going to be the storyline all week. Well, we let, let's kind of briefly hit pause here, but for for, for a, a reason, get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get one hundred and fifty dollars in bonus bets with any winning five dollar bet. That's one hundred and fifty bucks if your bet wins. Bet all of your favorite NBA players and teams and college players and teams. We'll talk about why in just a second with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Pilgrim and shoot your shot. Uh, Sean, the official final four odds were uh, released and have been released over the last, you know, obviously since the bracket got revealed, but a lot of it has been finalized with the props and stuff. Uh, let's run through some of them. We'll talk first about uh, just this Oakland matchup, what the odds look like and you know, some of the individual player props that I'm personally excited about. Kentucky is a 13 and a half point favorite with a 12 minus 1200 money line uh, over under 162.5 point, uh, points over uh, the player points, 19.5 for Antonio, 13.5 for Rob and 12.5 for Reed. Uh, pick one of that group that you think is a guaranteed hit. Did you go? Did you meet yourself? Yeah, and I lost you go. for a second too. Okay, what what was the last thing you heard? The the odds. What were what were you saying? Nineteen point five for Antonio, ten point five for DJ, thirteen point five for Rob, and twelve point five for Reed. Who's hitting in this Oakland game? Robin Reed, both. Ooh, Robin Reed, both. I like both those. So that'd be a, a combined twenty six points for for the two of them. And I will say that Jack Golke, um, twelve point five points. That's the sharpshooter that is going that just flamethrower from from deep. That just high high volume dude, the highest volume dude in the tournament. That is definitely one to keep a very close eye on as well. I just think I just think Robin Reed are going to be on the floor so much that the volume and everything and, and making shots. Like I, I just feel like this tournament is made for Rob Dillingham. So any kind of Rob Dillingham odds and, and points, like I'm leaning over on him because you saw it the other night in Nashville, he's going to take and he's going to make shots. Ooh. All right. Hold on. I'm speaking something into existence. DJ Wagner is going to be the MVP of this game. As we said, kind of like the same Brandon Knight thing where the Princeton vibe where we need somebody down the stretch to kind of just get you a, a clutch bucket. He kind of had a rough game against Texas a and I'm feeling DJ for that one. But NC State upsets to, to Texas Tech to get to the round of 32. We face Joel Justice in the NC State, State Wolf Pack against Rob Dillingham, who was once committed to NC State, the hometown program, and Rob Dillingham goes for 40. That is when whatever that player prop would be. Again, we got to get past Oakland first and foremost. That's all we care about. But should we get to that point, you better believe I am going to do everything in my power to just hammer, 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 hammer any of the Rob Dillingham props if it's NC State. That is that is Rob Dillingham in a vacuum. If there's ever a dream scenario for Rob, it is NC State in the round of 32. I believe you're right. <laughs> I, believe, I believe you're 100% right. Uh, there's some storylines here, right, for Kentucky, that if you you get matched up in, in that game. That would be uh, that would be an interesting one to, to follow and, and see how it goes. But I, I'm with you on Rob. I, I just – this is Rob's moment. Like, this, this tournament is made for Rob. Kappa baby, he even I can't believe he said it too. Like it, he says, "What's your what's your favorite March moment?" Oh, Kemba's run. We're like, it's like uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in that movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where he's like he sees himself on the screen. Look, look, it, mm, th that's what we're all feeling. We, it, it, we, this is Rob's tournament. I I'm so excited. I've I've bought all the way in, man. I'm so just. 
on, on that note, I, I kind of missed missed a point here. The odds for Kentucky to make the Sweet 16 minus 128. That's what so I was looking at a moment ago. Vegas now feels pretty darn confident that we're we're going to a second weekend, which is something that I think Kentucky fans will absolutely love to hear. And then just on that note, uh, Elite Eight plus 260 and then to win the South region. Little interesting, plus 700. That's where the odds really start to kind of veer off track where Houston's the pretty – Firm, overwhelming favorite at plus 145, Marquette at plus 500, Duke at plus 650. I don't know what anything Duke is doing right now to make you think that they're you know, third highest in the region, but whatever, I digress. Then plus 700 for Kentucky, plus 1,200 for Wisconsin, plus 1,500 for Florida. And, the, and Kentucky to win the national championship, plus 3,000. And then final four most outstanding player, Kentucky's – uh, Antonio Reeves at plus 7,000. Reed Shepard at plus 7,000. Trey Mitchell off the top rope, uh, plus 12,000. Rob Dillingham plus 18,000. If you're looking for value, plus 18,000 for Rob Dillingham, final four most outstanding player. Bro. And then DJ Wagner at plus 25,000. Oh, my God. I can't wait. It's it's here, Jack. Like, it's uh, it's here. And uh, I'm, I'm excited, though. Like, I know... We started this episode with some doom and gloom. I, I mean, I was in my feelings coming back from Nashville. I'm not going to lie to you. And you know, me and you talked after the game. But now that we've got a bracket, the moment I saw a bracket, it's go time. None of none of what happened matters. It matters now. This is the environment that you've created, John Calipari, like that nothing matters till March. Now's your time and opportunity to go prove it and to get this thing back going in the right direction. And the next two weeks can change a lot. They can change a lot either way. Because if you underperform, oh boy, it's going to be worse than it's ever been. And if you perform where everybody thinks you're capable of getting, it can certainly shift and, and heal a lot of the pain that has gone on for the last four or five years. Like, this is a pressure-packed tournament. There's no way around it. We've been talking about this tournament since last June. It all comes down to this. And maybe that's why there was some tension and some stress and some other things the last few months because we know we were leading that road to get here. And I think a lot of it was anticipation of just getting to this point. And now that we're here, reset and let's do this thing, Jack. And let's hopefully a lot of these odds and things that we're sitting here talking about we're talking about some of those in Kentucky and for the next three weeks. And we're seeing how those things shift and change. <laughs> Matt G says, you guys will need to cancel the show for the summer. If they underperform, we're not doing those. Uh, we're, not, we're not doing those, those what ifs uh, Cal said in his radio show. If you talk about any of those, what ifs, you're not a real fan. So we're not, if we're they, not going to do that. Cause I'm definitely not a real fan. Clearly if win, as, as you guys can't tell if they win, we're going on a summer tour. <laughs> When we win, when we go to like that's I think that's the coolest part. I have promised myself that if we make it to the final four, I am taking little man five who five month five months today, Billy, happy birthday, five month birthday to him. I'm taking him to the final four with Katie. So that, that's where we're gonna have him come and we're, it, we're, we're going to celebrate together. That's something that I'm very much looking forward to. So that's what we're rooting for. That's the end goal here. That's the, 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 that's the dream pie in the sky scenario for Kentucky. That is very much like right there. It's with, it's within reach. The path is there. Everything is laid out for it. Come on. Just win let's, games. Let's make it just win games. Just four. win games. Just win four. They did, they did it to close out the regular season. They won five straight. Like it's, uh, we, we've seen what that looks like before I get too far off. I got to, Knock out a couple more things real quick. Uh, FanDuel, uh, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. This was just like the longest FanDuel ad of all time. Uh, 21 and older and present in Kentucky. First online real money wager. Only $10 first deposit required bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets, which expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER. And while we're talking about Pittsburgh and what the venue looks like getting excited for this trip how about you just 
go to Pittsburgh and fill that stadium up yourself with our friends at game time. You shouldn't have to worry when you are buying tickets to the next big event. Now is on the time for guesswork with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat and their best price guarantee. Game time does all the hard work for you. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event. And even an hour after it starts, it's the place to find last minute seats, find exclusive flash deals and sponsor deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Game time is the only ticketing app that gives you a complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy. So you know exactly what to expect when you arrive, uh, arrive all in prices show up. Uh, total up front so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out i'm i mean i'm looking at the app right now cheapest get in price 88 bucks uh section 230 row e uh, you getting to pittsburgh getting into this venue kind of picking up where we left off in nashville but with a win like that's that's something that you want to experience experience be there it's a five and a half hour drive from lexington there's no reason why Pittsburgh can't be the destination for Kentucky fans. So let, let's make it a little party. Let's let's go in and, and kind of show Pittsburgh what we're all about. I know there are a lot of cool ties with Trey Mitchell being from there, Adu Thiero being from there, Cal being from the area, uh, Orlando Antigua coached and played at, at Pitt. So uh, a really cool opportunity, I think, for just a lot of different ties and just proximity. I think it's a, a very easy drive that I will be making myself with producer steven who's on the other side of the camera yeah i'll be there too i'll be there with uh with you guys and i'm sure we'll be doing some source to say episodes and hopefully we'll be doing some some live stuff somewhere jack where maybe people that go and get in can can come and watch and sit on source to say as well but you know game time and, and things like that's get in that building i said it earlier get in the building and make a difference, get Kentucky through Oakland and get on into that second weekend of the NCAA tournament because that's that's the hurdle they have to clear. Get to the yeah. second weekend and be in the conversation for a Final Four. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's knock a couple other things out real quick. Source Say Podcast is also brought to you by Andy Ludicky and MyPerfectFranchise.net. Andy is a franchise consultant uh, as well as franchise owner and helps people find franchises that fit their skill sets, financial requirements, time to commit, and more. His services are 100% free, and he is here to help if you have any questions about business ownership. You can learn more and contact Andy anytime at www.myperfectfranchise.net. And because I have uh, the brain of a fruit fly, I also forgot the close of the game time as well. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code KSR for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account and redeem code KSR for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Why the hell are you laughing at me? Because I'm I'm losing my mind over here. Because we, we took like 14 minutes between beginning and end on one. And then we just went, I just remember. And then Andy was covering up me laughing. And then Steven just takes him off the screen. So, dude, uh, we're a little all over the place tonight. But, well, because we, unfortunately had planned on several shows down in nashville that didn't happen obviously because we were there for 12 minutes so i kind of have to like adjust now accordingly because this is kind of like the post game show we never got a chance to do because you know getting back home getting back settled in having to adjust with work and then leading straight into selection sunday it's just been absolute freaking chaos so um, yeah, we're, we're kind of having to like combine and uh, like Frankenstein this, this show with a bunch of different stuff, but ideally the plan is to be in Pittsburgh all freaking weekend long. We're going to have a blast and we're going to do several different shows and, uh, you know, hopefully interact with fans and do this the right way. That's something that I, I've missed to, uh, you know, be able to just say, Hey, we're doing this show from fill in the blank, this lobby of this hotel or whatever, you know, come hang out with us, come talk. We really love that opportunity if you're going up to Pittsburgh. So uh, let us know in the, in the chat if you are planning on going down there and, um, you know, kind of taking taking Pittsburgh over, making it a, a sea of blue. We'd love to be a part of your sea of blue. So um, very much looking forward to the crowd. They they deserve this moment. They deserve a run just like the players do, just like this this coaching staff does. It's been a, kind of an all-in effort to get to this point. I'm looking forward to the payoff that these fans absolutely deserve. Yeah, me, me too. And 
and seeing the fans in that environment, like it's just a different level when you get to the postseason. Like people that that, that go and, and closer to the, like there's going to be Kentucky fans that closer to Pittsburgh that are going to go to this one that didn't go to the one in Greensboro a year ago. That's what makes BBN what it is. So uh, I'm looking forward to it as well, Jack. And and hopefully wherever we're set up and recording, whether it's in a parking lot or somewhere outside an arena, we uh, we got people sitting there listening to us. And, and if there are any fans that have any ideas for us to record or whatever, you know, I'd love to be able to, you know, do that in an official way instead of just kind of like saying 10 minutes before we start, Hey, come meet us in this lobby. Like let's do this the right way and kind of do a little watch party or something. That'd be a, a lot of fun. You know what else is a lot of fun factors, f- delicious, ready to eat meals, making <laughs> eating better every day. Easy. Wherever tomorrow takes you, be ready with pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. You'll have uh, over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan, and veggie, uh, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. What are you waiting for? Get started today and have a feel-good week of meals ready to go. Two-minute meals fuel up. Fast with Factors restaurant quality meals that are ready to eat and eat. Uh, heat and eat whenever you are. Snack smoothies and more. Discovered a, a wide variety of easy options for the entire day, like breakfast, midday bites, and more. Sign up and save. We've done the math. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking to uh, for fast upscale options done easily no prep no mess meals factor or meals are 100 ready to eat and heat uh, so there's no i guess you would eat heat before eating uh so there's no prepping cooking or cleanup needed call uh head to factormeals.com slash ksr50 and use code ksr50 to get 50 percent off that's code ksr50 at factormeals.com slash ksr50 to get 50 percent off Sean, I'm losing my absolute freaking mind. You, you need those efficient meals the next couple of weeks, though. My goodness. Just try one as we're planning on doing. <laughs> Matt G said, better not end the da- on the show, the show on a damn ad. I, I would never do that. Uh, Only when never. I kind of forget to do them and have to fit them in at the very end. I'd never do something like that. No, we're... we're this is a big week. This is a very important week that I don't think it's any secret. Like the patience and the it's you know it's been a minute since we've seen just what this looks like I'll, I'll i have not seen a sunday in the sec tournament part of this is i've just never experienced what a sunday looks like i've never been um so i'm looking for i was looking forward to that part of the reason why i was a little pissy going home and then i haven't been to a second weekend doing this job with the ncaa tournament so that's something that i am very selfishly looking forward to just seeing what that feels like the pressure the weight of the world on, you know, my shoulders and our shoulders is I've just never experienced it. So it's just, this team has a different vibe than others that we've seen in the past. You didn't feel that way, whether you believed it or not, even Oscar, that team, the first year when he won, you know, consistent national player of the year, that, that team had some pretty clear, like, injuries and different things that were kind of like, man, we, we hope that things work out, but it's just, Mm, it's rough. And then last year, I don't know if there was ever a point where we felt truly all in on that feeling. It, this one, we've seen the vision. We know what it looks like. We've seen this team compete at its best. We've seen it recently. I mean, we are a week removed from them taking care of business against who ended up being the number one two seed in in the NCAA tournament. So the pieces are there. The foundation is set. Now it's time for them to go take care of business and you know, kind of all of us be able to celebrate together this weekend, next weekend, and very hopefully the one after that. Yeah. And I mean, it's a, I mean, how about the state of Kentucky in this tournament? Kentucky, Western Kentucky, Moorhead State, like pretty good state of basketball, <laughs> if you ask me. So I think uh, all three of those teams have, have chances, obviously, to, to win games and go on runs here. But uh, I'm ready for this thing to get started. I'm ready to, to, for 7 10. Eastern time on Thursday to want, just get the ball tipped and get out there and run up and down the floor. And let's see where this thing, and I'm not going to break into a one shining moment song. Cause that's probably what it sounded like. The ball is tipped. <laughs> and so, there you are. 
Um, hey, if, if Kentucky wins the national championship, I will sing that song word for word on the show. I th- did you see the video of the very first one shining moment when Indiana won it in the eighties? I did. That video was on Twitter four days ago, something like that. Five, right, right before the SEC championship, uh, it was the very first one shining moment ever, and I was laying there with little man, little Billy, and I played it. And I was like watching it with him together on the phone. We watched one shining moment together. And I had a tear come out of my eye at the end of it. Like swear to God, and a whole ass tear fell out of my eye. And it was like, it's time. It's time. And I was like, slap out of it, Jack. We got business. We got business to take care of. We can't be uh, being sappy right now, but that, that is the emotion. That's, that's the feeling. It's like, man, Let's let's finally do this. Like let's make this happen. It it feels right. This is the team. It has the personalities. It has the talent. Let's just push all of our chips in on this. Um, we have one. Matt G. I believe said um, live chat questions. Do you want to do like five minutes of yeah qu- answering questions? I think yeah, that sounds fun. We haven't been able to do that yeah. in a minute. So get your questions in right now while I do one final ad. I swear on my life, it's the last one. I, I, I swear it is. Uh, while you get a, a couple last minute questions in uh, for us, let's get a message in from our latest partner, Monticello Bank. Well, hello, Cindy. A lot of banks are changing hands these days, not Monticello. We've been building relationships since 1895, and with each passing year, we've grown. Hello, Cindy. Hi. And expanded our services to meet the needs of the communities we serve. Are you forgetting something? Monticello Bank, equal housing lender, member FDIC. Oh, and one. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we're 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 <laughs> we're done. I I don't know what. What it, my deal is tonight? I'm just I'm I'm on one. My bad. Um, uh, Lump Nub says, uh, "What is your ideal rotation, Sean?" Let's let's throw that to you to, to open this thing. Well, I think it's more so about it's not as much about crunching numbers as it is who is in those numbers. And, and to me, when it comes to minutes played, and, and it's obviously shifted a lot, Jack, in the last few weeks for me because at one point Trey Mitchell was going to eat up a ton of minutes for me in a rotation, but he's just struggled to kind of break through. Now, I know box score the other night reflected it, but he still is a guy that doesn't look comfortable to me. Rob Dillingham, Reed Shepard leading the charge as much as possible in the backcourt alongside Antonio Reeves. That's where it starts and ends with me. Those three guys have to be on the floor. You need shot makers to carry you along this run. That's where it starts. With DJ Wagner, Justin Edwards in there, I'm still leaning Z over the other two bigs. And then you throw in Trey Mitchell and a Duthiero, and you mix and match how you want to at the four with those two guys. But I think those three guards that I named to start it off is where Kentucky wins this tournament or they lose this tournament if they don't get enough shots and enough minutes together on the floor. Uh, Nick Bowman says, do SEC refs get to call SEC teams in the tourney? No. And I had a conversation with a college ref that uh, after the loss, because I, you know, there's one that follows some of our stuff closely. And I, I he has followed up in some of my public gripes about officiating is like, Hey, I feel you, but here's like the actual rule for future reference, like like the the cylinder rule and some of the other things where I was just ignorantly talking typical. But in those instances where he's like, hey, I love you, man, but you weren't totally correct here. Here's what the actual rule is. So I reached out after that that one, um, th- this Texas A&M loss and was like, hey, just just give me like humor me. Was it? was it as bad as we thought it was like, was it as bad as we felt? And he said, I'll never blame officiating for any loss ever. I I don't think officials have enough say to, you know, swing a game in that way. But yes, there were some that, um, you know, he disagreed with, but that's every game, you know, he was kind of the, the, but that's every game. You just kind of have to learn to, you know, live with the highs and lows and know that it's just kind of a, a time and place thing, blah, blah, blah. So, that made me feel a little bit better, but then he also said, uh, 
Kentucky not having SEC offici- uh, officials in March should should help significantly. Just in, you know, it's a new ear to listen to Cal. You know, it's like it's just a, a fresh take on on things that Cal that maybe some refs haven't you know haven't gotten the same earfuls that maybe Doug Shouse has gotten and maybe Pat Adams has gotten and you know some of the the specifics. So I think that will help. And yes, I'm very glad that we don't have to. Uh, experience uh, some of the guys that we saw specifically in Nashville because I did not like them. Um, Let's see. Could be injury related, but do we have time to get uh, Trey Mitchell back in the swing of things, Sean? Oh, we'll see. I mean, obviously like Cal sees value in playing him and regardless of what it looks like, I think he's going to play a ton of minutes this weekend. And hopefully, well, you saw Chin Coleman come out of that timeout the other night when he got got a basket, and I think it was mm-hmm. the basket that actually put Kentucky in the lead there early in the game after they got off to the poor start. Chin was fired up coming out of the timeout because you could tell that they're trying to, to push Trey and build some confidence to get him back. Would love to see him have a good game against Oakland to then build confidence going into because at one point this season, I called him their most important player because of how he was involved and intertwined in everything they were doing offensively, not as much now, not moving as well. And when you don't play for a number of weeks, it's hard to find that back. And that's some of that stuff I was talking about with disrupting rhythm. Getting to a second weekend is big, though, because you get another full week of him working his way back in with practice reps and you get a couple of games under your belt. So I think surviving the first weekend would be a big thing towards getting him back to where you want him to be for the second weekend. I feel actually pretty good that we're going to see good Trey Mitchell in March. I I mean, I don't think it's been a very big surprise. I'm a big Trey Mitchell fan. We've talked about him extensively this season. The, the way that his addition has changed what this roster is, the identity of this team and the offense, like I think that none of that happens without Trey Mitchell's addition. So I think that isn't just gone – you know, it d- develop, you know, just erase into oblivion. Like, I think that he just has been very, very, very slow to get back to Trey Mitchell. So we just, you know, it's been because he kind of had that issue of first it was, you know, one injury, then, you know, but it was the back, then came back and then immediately dealt with a shoulder. So kind of balancing both of those things, he had to, to rehab both. So it's not just as simple as, Hey, as a tweaked ankle, it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff together that although it's taken a minute, he did take, so he, I, I saw some strides out of him uh, against Texas A&M. I thought it was a slow start. I didn't think he was getting a lot of lift on his, on his jumps and rebounding, you know, he got called for that push off, push off on the on the rebound, and I was like, man, I, it's because he didn't have the same lift as he did. But even as the game progressed, he there was a level of confidence and comfort that he played with that he was getting to some of the spots that we hadn't seen him do. So I think we're close. I, I don't know if we'll see it against Oakland. Hopefully, we you know get past Oakland and we can talk about what he would look like in a round of thirty two or, or Sweet Sixteen or whatever. But I think we're close. So hopefully, we see it this weekend at some point. And, definitely beyond that um we can't just say recruiting updates i mean that's that's that that would take 30 minutes to get through but there are a a couple specific ones liam mcneely yeah i've heard kentucky has reached out they are interested um i've heard cal specifically really likes him i don't you know the the fit is interesting because you already have billy richmond committed carter knox committed what happens with some of the wings the do thero jordan burks like it, it feels like you're adding another wing but he is unbelievably skilled i've been a big fan of lee mcneely i thought kentucky should have pursued him a little bit harder uh hit the, his first recruitment before he decommitted from from indiana obviously so that's one i'm keeping an eye on i know cal likes him quite a bit so uh we'll definitely see what happens there uh sean uh, Ernest Kirk Belcher says, what zones does Oakland run? Are they switching all the time like Syracuse? I've not I've not got to dive into their film as much yet on, on what Oakland does, but I'm planning to do that tomorrow. And then I know we were talking about doing something and getting it out there before the, the opening game on Thursday, Jack. So I'm, I'm going to dive into that the next few days and really look at them and, and see where Kentucky goes. I'm, I'm not as concerned about teams that zone Kentucky. Because I, I think that you're going to see Kentucky make shots. They got plenty of guys that can do that 
and, and stuff. And and I think that that that's not an area that's going to really stump me a, a whole lot. Now, if they're shuffling back and forth and mixing things up and changing the pace of the game, just maybe to slow Kentucky down a little bit, then I think it becomes very important for Kentucky to get quality shots. Like I thought Rob took a couple of quick ones the other day. Yeah. In, in moments where Kentucky needed to execute and get something. And that's where I thought the pressure started to hit Kentucky a little bit with the deficit staying around eight to nine to 10 for the second half and Rob trying to come get it all in one. Like that's what changing defenses can do to you. So I'm, I'm hoping that, that Kentucky can kind of settle in. That's why I think it's important to play with the lead. Cause if you're playing with the lead, then you can kind of dictate the way the game's going. Whereas if Oakland or somebody, whoever you're playing here this first weekend has a lead on you, then they can can manage the game a little bit differently and do some things trying to keep you off balance and slow Kentucky down. So I'm going to dive into that stuff the next few days. Uh, Charles Washburn, does Big Z become a star in the tournament? It, I don't know if star is the right word, but it does feel like there is an avenue there for Z to have just like a that's something that nobody else in college basketball can throw out there. You know, like it feels like there's going to be a moment where Z goes for 13, five and two blocks, three blocks. And that is his, you know, the star moment. So I don't know if we're ever, if we're going to see a 25 point performance or whatever, you know, I guess it's just relative to what your definition of star is, but I do see a, a role and an avenue for Z to have his shining mo moment, so to speak. What do you think, John? I think so. And, and I still think that of the three, I think Z gives them the best chance to win consistently because of his skill set and the things that he can do offensively. And, you know, he can still affect shots at the rim. No one is perfect in this front court. Like they don't have the elite in seven footer out of the three. But I think settling in and finding one that they can just find a stretch of really good play for a few games, I think it can make a world of difference in Kentucky winning a round or losing a round, honestly. So I think Z, to me, is the one that fits the other pieces on this team the best. And I've been saying that for a month now. And that's where I would like to see the minutes kind of reflect it in this tournament. If not, then I'm still in, in kind of the, the group that Trey Mitchell at the five does some stuff for you and gives you one of your better looks that you've had all season, but you can get some similar looks with, with Z there too. So I, I think he can Jack. I think that of the three bigs having a breakout, that's the one that I expect to have it and sustain it the most over the others. Ugo's yeah. still behind the game offensively. Like mm -hmm. he missed a two footer the other day, right in front of the rim and short armed it. Like, just struggles to hold on to the ball, struggles to get the ball, things like that. There's, there's all of them struggle. It's just some struggle more than, than Z. And I think Z complements what they want to do the most. Uh, Ty Starn says, um, don't want NC State. They might be, uh, trouble cooking at the right time. That's an interesting one because I know Kemba and the winning five games in five days and going on the run, it's like the dream scenario, but. Five games in five days is a whole lot on your plate. And then to follow that up with a Thursday game, then, you know, following that up with, a, you know, again on, on Saturday, like that's, that's stringing together a lot of play for a team that really wasn't very good during the regular season. Like they snuck their way in for a reason. They had to play five games in five days for a reason. So maybe Kemba is the, the vision there, but that's, that's our story. That Kemba is, you know, Rob is our story with the, the Kemba comparison. It's not going to be NC State. So, no. So, uh, but I, 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 I understand the point, though. I, I do that. There's like a little part of me that is concerned about that. But I think big picture, it just, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, let's just do a couple more here because I know we're uh, running very long. I said five minutes of questions and we went, went on for 15. But um, let's see. We're, that's, we're usually. That's usually who we are. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. I did I go through all of them, maybe? Uh oh, the seeing it in person, uh, how Kentucky handled the physicality of Texas AM. Is that really why we lost? Um, he said earlier about the you know SEC uh commentator net, network commentators talking about that and how um, you know, the physicality was the the main thing that kind of 
stop Kentucky from being able to dig in and win that game. How much in person did you did you think seeing it? Uh, how much did that impact the loss? Well, I said I said to you that I thought Kentucky got bullied a lot at times. But then again, I think the way that the game was officiated kind of dictated some of it because there were some calls where Kentucky – I mean, Antonio Reeves got caught, whistled for a couple of fouls that just were terrible calls. And his fourth foul was one of the worst. And oh, completely oh. changed the game of, of how it was going. Like a, a guy literally flopped and landed in the exact spot that he took off from. Like he literally went straight up, straight down. There was no contact and no push in the back there. So I, I do think that they got pushed around. But more of it was in ball screen stuff. Kentucky gives up straight line drives out of ball screens, Jack. And it's just blowing by bigs and a guard getting downhill and snaking the ball and finishing at the rim. Like that's the stuff that's get cleaned up. And then you get a do the arrow having to overhelp a ton because you're trying to erase stuff at the rim and then you're giving up threes that you can't, you got to take away one of the two. You can't be giving up layup after layup after layup at the rim and then also letting a team just shoot lots out from three on you. Usually you take away one of the two. Kentucky didn't take away any of those. Shots at the rim and the three-point line. A&M got what they wanted, and uh, I do think that A&M has – I think A&M is a bad matchup for Kentucky because I think they got two guys that just see or smell blood in the water when they see Kentucky and they know that they can get what they want against them. And I think that it's just more of a confidence thing. And that's what this tournament is. It's matchup based. And you have matchups that you like. And I think that that's uh, kind of what happened to Kentucky is I think they got pushed around to an extent. And I think A&M just played with a ton of confidence and had every right to. Yeah. Um, Reed Wall Davis, National Freshman freshman of the Year. How about that great company? Yeah, Reed Shepard named National Freshman of the Year today. How unbelievable is that? Like, is that not the coolest thing to knowing what we knew going into the year and what our expectations were for DJ and Justin and Aaron and some of those guys? And, you know, those they've all had, you know, solid seasons in their own right for what they're, you know, kind of the, the adjusting the expectation as the season went on relative to what we clearly, you know, what they ended up being. But Reed and Rob have been on a whole different planet and seeing Reed especially take over as the, you know, the lowest rank recruit out of all of them has just been such a cool moment for him. So to get those national freshman of the year honors, I, I don't think there's anything cooler than that. No, no, super cool. And and the guys in the, in the company that he's been in with those names on that list that have won that, you know, from Kentucky, like that's that right there tells you all you need to know about, about Reed Shepard. But Jack, the last couple of minutes here, why don't we for two or three minutes just talk about Kentucky's half of the bracket? And just yep. kind of make some some picks of of who we maybe see here, like on the bottom half with Kentucky. I mean, you got Florida. I think Boise State is my sleeper pick to come out of the bottom half there and, and see Kentucky. Wow. In the I don't I don't know how you feel about it. I love Lutz in Western Kentucky. You know, I'm I'm friends with that staff. I am pulling as hard as I'm pulling for Kentucky. I'm equally pulling as hard for Western Kentucky to beat Marquette because I, I want to see Western Kentucky do its thing there. But I, I that bottom half of the bracket there is one of the most intriguing sections in the entire field to me because I see three or four teams that can end up making it to a Sweet 16. And Marquette, I think Western, I think they're well coached. Florida. Boise State, but I'm going to go Boise State to, to beat Kentucky's Sweet 16 opponent. Man, that's a tough one because Florida has been like a sneaky SEC team all year long. They, I mean, shoot, beat beat us at Rupp. So we know how good they've been playing. How do they respond dealing with the injury news that they just dealt with? And, you know, individual impact aside of the player himself, just the mindset of, you know, do you rally behind that kind of in a Kevin Ware type deal like we saw in 2013 with Louisville? 
well, I, I guess that never really existed. So, um, other examples of people rallying behind injuries, you know, in, in runs. So I'm interested to see what that does to them, but I've been a big fan of Florida and what they've been doing this year. So that's one I'm keeping an eye on, but yeah, boys, State, that's a, that's gonna be a really fun matchup. I'm keeping a very close eye on. Um, it's a team that defends too. They're in the they're top 30 in the country in Kim Palm and adjusted D they're, they're around, I think 49th or 50th in, in adjusted O like they, they have metrics that, that show up and, and if they can win that that game, obviously they got to win the playing game. So they got to win three games to, to get there. I, I think that's a team, though, that it wouldn't shock me to see in that round as a double digit seed. Yeah, they, I guess on the other side of the bracket, Texas A&M, a chance to you know get a, a third individual matchup with them. That's one that um, you know we'd have to see them in the Elite Eight for a chance to go to the Final Four. That would be an interesting one. Obviously, Duke or Wisconsin. Obviously, those storylines write themselves. Um, you, you know, Houston has been playing among the best of the best all year long. They're the physical, gritty, defensive, high motor, you know, well coached group that that on paper is a direct kind of you know co contradiction of Kentucky in terms of just styles of play and you know what their philosophies are and identities are. So that's going to be one that I think most people would have their eyes on hoping that that's the elite eight matchup. What, what do you, what do you think about the top of that bracket there? The, the top of it to me, like A&M Jack, I can, I can, I was having this conversation with somebody today that when you look at this bracket, I can see Texas A&M losing the first game of the tournament, or I could also see them upsetting Houston and getting to the sweet 16. Yeah. So that's an intriguing team to me, given what the they, they've done against Kentucky and things. And, and, I, and I like Buzz. I, I really think that he's an excellent coach. I think that he has his guys ready to play, especially this time of year. So Houston, to me, though, the way that they defend, I'm going to go Houston to come out of the top half of it. But don't be shocked if if, if it's A&M in that round of 32, if A&M doesn't push them and, and find its way to the Sweet 16, too. Duke is the one out of the, the top four that I just don't have any confidence in to to get to the to the second weekend. I, I wouldn't be shocked if, if Duke goes down and falls before the Sweet 16. How about James Madison? Is that 5-12 upset? They've been unbelievable all year. They've been ranked all year. Uh, you know, Wisconsin has been really, really up and down, kind of needing some hot, you know, hot stuff in the – uh, in their their conference tournament, so I kind of like that twelve five upset, and then I think they are going to be in position, you know, similar style of play with Duke. I think they're going to be in position to beat Duke and be a Sweet Sixteen runner as well. So that's definitely one that uh, I'm keeping a close eye on. I, I'll, I'll, you know what? Let's let's call call my shot, James Madison, as the Sweet Sixteen taking on Houston, and I and I think they're. Cinderella Cinderella magic runs out there, then it becomes Houston coming out of the top of that. Uh, and then I do, I, I mean, I know some people were making fun of me in the chat. Adam Elkins, especially was talking about me picking Kentucky to go all the way last year in our little KSR thing. We're doing that tomorrow night, by the way. And guess what? I'm going to do the same thing again this year. And nobody can ever take that away from me, but uh, I'm a, uh, I'll definitely have Kentucky coming out of uh, that. Sue me. That's, that's just how I operate. You know, it is what it is, but I think it's going to end, end up being the kind of, Big haymaker of both styles, all offense versus all defense for a spot in, in Phoenix. I think that's that's how this so story is going to be written one way or the other. Can they overcome against a, a defensive juggernaut like that? Can they lock in on the other end and, you know, come up with stops and, and you know, kind of win a rock fight that we saw a little bit of it uh, down in Knoxville? I'm I'm thinking the same thing. So let's make it happen. It, well, it's been a go for it. Well, double digit seeds to Sanford's beating Kansas. Like Sanford, oh, yeah. I, I think Sanford has got a chance to to run to the Sweet 16, and then another double digit seed to keep your eye on, Oregon. Oh, Nafali Dante, yeah. baby! That pay attention, I mean, pay attention to Oregon. Oregon over South Carolina, eleven over six. Hmm, that'd be a fun one. In that one. And I think McNeese. I think Will Wade is a dog, and I think that team is a dog. I I'm I'm confidently putting them in the Sweet 16. That's my like. I I think that's a really, really well coached team. And that's a team that's firing on all cylinders. That's that's one I'm keeping a very close eye on. I think they're going to Sweet 16. 
Yeah, and there, there's going to be a name or two pop up here in this tournament that's going to put themselves in position to get some bigger jobs. And it's those are the teams that you watch. That's why Will Wade that's will why be there's one. exactly that's why there's so much value in this tournament just to win a game or two if you're a smaller school. Because it puts you on a different platform if you win a game. Because the entire country is watching college basketball. Mm-hmm. And everybody wants what's hot. And you kind of go on a run. I mean, we've seen it. Kentucky's been on the other hand of it with St. Peter's. And it's uh, fairly Dickinson and stuff in, in the past. Like, there, there's always those teams that guys get jobs. Who's the coach in this tournament that, that does it? And I, I think there's some guys there, obviously. And a lot of them on Kentucky's side of the bracket. We'll see what happens. This has been a lot of fun. We will see you guys. And I, I like Matt G throwing in there one more. Throw, throw another ad in there, Jack. No, I, I think five or six is plenty for, for tonight. Uh, this is a blast, man. We're really looking forward to this run. We're going to uh, be heading to Pittsburgh here, I think, Wednesday, early, early morning. Uh, so we'll, we'll be there. We'll set up shop. We'll do some live shows. And we're, we're going to uh, be, be there through Sunday. And then we'll be planning our travel for uh for dallas so it's gonna be a blast we can't we we can't wait to meet you guys down there it's gonna be a lot of fun sean let's get out here where can fans find your work you can follow me at gbb country find me on twitter as well at jack pilgrim ksr subscribe to ksr plus we have a blast over there growing community and subscribe to the ksr youtube page plenty of awesome content coming from pittsburgh you will not want to miss it uh the whole gang is going to be there in, in pittsburgh so you know you you just uh, you just be waiting very, very patiently. We'll we'll uh, have the content coming. So appreciate each and every one of you for joining us on this extended edition of the Sources A podcast. We'll see you next time.